Welcome back to our series looking at some Muslim objections to the Bible and how to answer them. Here are a few more miscellaneous objections you may hear from your Muslim friends. One common one in the West is the claim that Muslims and Christians worship the same God. Of course, a lot of this discussion hinges on definitions. Here are a couple fun and yet lovingly direct ways to answer this. You could respond, I'm so glad to hear that you worship the same God as described in the Bible. Have you ever read the Bible? So we can always try to get them back into reading the Bible. Um, another one is, I'm so glad to hear that. What have you noticed about the God of the Bible, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and about our Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, who died for our sins and rose from the dead, that would make you conclude that we worship the same God as the God of the Quran? <clears throat> or another one, I'm so glad to hear that. What have you noticed about Christians that make you believe that we worship the same God that you worship? All three of these responses are respectful and invite further dialogue, but the second response especially immediately shows the Muslim that they're mistaken. They don't actually worship the same God, but you don't have to actually tell them that, they just sort of figure it out for themselves. In fact, the core beliefs for Christianity, uh, the core beliefs of Christianity about Jesus are literally the worst possible beliefs in Islam, called shirk, the one forgive, unforgivable sin in Islam. The third response can also provide insight as to the beliefs and motivations of your friend. Another objection is that Jesus was never crucified. Instead, God made someone else look like Jesus, and they crucified that person instead. Now, this comes from the Quran, Surah 4, Ayah 157 through 158, which says that they said in boast, We killed Jesus, Christ Jesus, the Son of Mary, the Apostle of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them, and so on and so forth. One way to answer this would be to simply show that this contradicts the Bible. Jesus said that he was crucified, John 20, verse 27, and that he rose from the dead, Revelation 1, 18, and other places. So who should I believe? You know, you or Jesus? Talk to your Muslim friend about that. Then, of course, they'll say that the Bible we have today was corrupted, and we've already talked about how to answer that objection. We can remind our friend that the Quran was written more than 500 years after the New Testament was written. So, you know, why would we trust something, you know, written so long after the events? Would you trust an allegedly historical account about an event which occurred 500 years ago, which contradicted all the reports of the, all the eyewitnesses that lived at that time? That doesn't really make sense, but you can discuss that with them. Um, there's another problem here, which is more philosophical. If our Muslim friend is saying that God deceived Jesus' most loyal 11 disciples and even caused them to die later as they were going around preaching to the Jews about Jesus' death and resurrection, then how can you know, my Muslim friend, that God did not deceive other people like Muhammad or that he's not deceiving you right now or other Muslims today, if that's the kind of deceptive God that you serve? It's kind of a self-refuting philosophical belief, the idea of following a message from a deceptive God. Now, we Christians do not have this problem because the God of the Bible does not lie. In fact, he cannot lie, as Titus 2, sorry, Titus 1, verse 2 says. This video link here from David Wood very thoroughly lays out this problem for Muslims, and I would encourage you to watch it. If you're deciding between going with the philosophical response or the response with Bible verses, I recommend starting with the Bible verses. Because it's always good to encourage our Muslim friends to read the Bible for themselves. Another objection is, we believe in all the prophets. Jesus was only a messenger. Muhammad is the last prophet in the line of biblical prophets. Now, if you have more time and your friend seems interested, the best way to answer this is to invite your friend to examine the Bible with you to see how closely Muhammad's teachings align with Jesus' teachings and the rest of the Bible's teachings. If you only have a short moment of time, you could turn to somewhere like Mark 12, 1 through 12, and read this parable of the vineyard and the wicked tenants. Then ask your friend questions like, who does the owner of the vineyard represent? Who are the wicked tenants? Who are the slaves? And then, who is this beloved son? And what does the phrase last of all mean? And then you can also look in John chapter 14 through 16 about Jesus' promise to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Um, and so Muslims like to say that this applies to Muhammad, actually, the paraclete or comforter. But as you go through the verses one by one and see if they can apply to Muhammad, it becomes clear that they can't apply. And you can see more articles on answeringislam.org and other places. Uh, you know, uh, Muhammad was never in his followers. Um, did Jesus send Muhammad? Oh, there's a lot of questions that you can go through about that. 
but that's about the Holy Spirit. So it shows that Jesus really is, uh, he was the last. Um, so there were all these other slaves, all these other prophets that came before, and then Jesus was the final one, the beloved son, Mark 12. And then Jesus' disciples wrote down his teachings and they started the church. Um, and so in a sense, uh, they were sort of part of Jesus' ministry. They were uh, writing down his words. As Jesus predicted in John 14 through 16, he said, you will write down these things uh, after I'm gone. The Holy Spirit will bring these things to your remembrance. Another objection is that it's not fair for God to punish Jesus for the sins of the world. Now, there's several aspects of this. One is, how can God punish one person for someone else's sins? Another aspect is, why did God punish Jesus, who is innocent, instead of us who are guilty? When you hear these questions, recognize that these are really good questions. I think there really is a shocking aspect of this gospel truth that the Muslim friends are right to be um, shocked by. There is no of courseness to it all. It's really amazing that God would do this. So in terms of the word fair, in terms of fairness, we'd say, yeah, sure, you're right. It's not fair. You know, as the hymn says, mine, mine was the transgression, but thine, the, the deadly pain. Jesus got the deadly pain for my sins. That's Isaiah 53 as well. But is it just? Is it right? Is it legally proper for God to do this? Is it allowed? for the God, the judge of all the earth, to do this? Yes, it is just. This objection implies that God is punishing some innocent bystander. But actually, according to the Bible, God himself is paying this penalty. As Jesus, the Son of God, and the member of the Trinity volunteered to do this out of his love. So it is completely just. Here's a possible analogy. Suppose a young man's son breaks into his store and steals some of his merchandise, goes and sells it on the market. And then later the young son repents, comes back to his father and says, I'm sorry. Suppose his father sees his son's change of heart and decides he's going to forgive his son. However, someone still has to pay for the stolen items or the broken items, the broken glass, whatever it might be. And the son probably doesn't have enough money to pay for all of it. If the father says, all right, I'm just going to write down this loss in my accounting books. I'm just going to pay for this cost myself. There's nothing wrong or unjust about that. The person who has been wronged has the right to forgive and the ability to repay. Uh, not necessarily an obligation to forgive, but uh, has the right to do that. Another example might be a loan co-signing done by a parent for a child. Similarly, you could say God, Father, Son, Spirit, in a sense, co-sign, saying, I will pay for this sin debt done by this sinful person, myself. Another example is Paul in his letter to Philemon in the Injil, writing about a runaway slave, Onesimus, who had repented and become a Christian. And at one point, he tells Philemon, if the slave has stolen anything from you, charge that to my account. In other words, Paul was offering to pay him back, even though the slave was the one who stole it. Is this fair, quote unquote? No. <laughs> you know, the slave did the wrong thing, Paul's paying for it. But is it just? Is it right? Is it good? Yes, it was a loving thing for Paul to do. Now, your friend might bring up Quran Surah 6, Ayah 164, which says that no bearer of burdens shall bear the burden of another and say that this means no one can pay for another person's sins. And actually, this fits in a very interesting way with Psalm 49, 7 through 9 which talked about, you know, basically, yeah, we can't pay for other people's sins. We're still paying for our own sins forever. But what about Jesus? Was he a bearer of burdens of his own sin? Actually, no. Jesus was the only sinless person who has ever lived. He's the only person who can bear the burden of another. And the angel says that he did actually do this. He died to save his people from their sins. Matthew 121. So... Yeah, I would encourage you to uh, get your Muslim friends reading what the Bible says about.